I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, and this is From His Heart Ministries. Hey, thanks for joining us today. We are beginning a new series called The Unknown God, Discovering the Person and Power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity, and He is the one most of us understand the least. I mean, we kind of have questions like, well, what does He do, and what's His ministry, and how is the Holy Spirit different from Jesus? We'll be in John 14 today, so I encourage you to grab your Bible and follow along and prepare your heart for a blessing as we look at the promise of the Spirit. Years ago, I heard a story about a guy, a young guy, just not a very smart guy. His name was Larry, and uh, (laughs) just saying, he was a student at the university uh, or at Duke University, but he failed out, and he went back to his little town in North Carolina, and uh, He wanted to get a job. He needed to get a job. And the sheriff in that little town, he was looking for a deputy. And so little Larry said, well, I want to be a deputy. So he told his friends, I'm going to apply for that job. I'm going to get that job. I'm going to be a deputy. So he gets an interview with the sheriff. And he sits down, and the sheriff says to him, he says, okay, little Larry. He knew little Larry was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. And he said, okay, little Larry. He said, "Uh, what's one and one? Little Larry said, 11. He said, well... Okay. He said, name two days of the week that start with T. Little Larry said, today and tomorrow. (laughs) He said, all right. He said, all right, little Larry, who killed Abraham Lincoln? Little Larry thought and thought and thought. He said, Sheriff, I don't know. Sheriff said, well, why don't you work on that one? Come back and we'll talk again next week. So little Larry said, yes. He left the office. He was walking down the street, saw some of his friends, and they said, hey, little Larry, how did the interview go? He said, it went great. It's only my first day, and I'm already working on a murder case. (laughs) Well, today, we are embarking, not on a murder case, but we're embarking on a discovery. You know, a, a, a sheriff, a deputy, if they're going to research something to find out uh, what happened, they got to do some discovery. So we're embarking on a discovery today to discover the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. I've entitled this new series, The Unknown God. Now, it's not because the Holy Spirit is unknown, but when we think about God in terms of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we know a lot more about God the Father, we know a lot more about God the Son, and we struggle sometimes with God the Holy Spirit. He's kind of mysterious to us. He's kind of like, hmm. Not 100% sure uh, about him. You know, he, he's kind of uh, uh, just, just a mystery to many of us. And sadly, some churches, they really have moved away from the Holy Spirit because they have seen abuses on television or in churches and uh, things in the name of the Holy Spirit. And they say, well, I don't know about that. That's, that seems like craziness. That seems if you go uh, in with the Holy Spirit, you're going to start uh, running laps around the church and jump, jumping pews and picking up snakes. And, and you're doing just kind of some crazy stuff. So people get nervous about the Holy Spirit and they kind of back off and That's a tragedy. God wants us to discover the wonderful person and power of the Holy Spirit, the unknown God to many of us. You see, I believe this, that when you and I really understand the person of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, the the desire of the Holy Spirit as it relates to your life, my life, your church, my church, your marriage, my marriage, our families, our community, our schools. When we really understand what he wants to do and we get in sync with what he wants to do and we join hands with what he wants to do, 
there's no telling all that he will do in and through us. You know, we talk a lot about life change, life change, life change. I was listening to a guy the other day and he was saying, hey, preachers, quit, quit telling everybody that every one of the, your sermons is, is this is gonna change your life. He said, you know, if you say that every single time, then people, they get deadened to it. There's no sermon that's gonna change your life. There's no uh, teaching that's gonna change your life. The one who changes your life is the Holy Spirit of God. He will change your life. He will change your marriage. He will change everything about you and about us and give us power to make such a difference in this community for Christ, starting in our own homes, starting in our own schools, starting in our own church. So let's embark today on the unknown God, discovering the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Now, the Gospel of John, as you know, is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic, which means seeing the same. That's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, cover the same stories. And they, they might give you a little different variation of that story, but it, it, they're very, very similar in what they talk about. John is very, very different. John's not a synoptic. He doesn't see the same. And John gives you much more dialogue and, and uh, sermonizing and, and monologue, so to speak, from the Lord Jesus. He Lots, if you have a red letter Bible edition, lots of red letters in the Gospel of John because Jesus is speaking so much in the Gospel of John. And from John 13 to John 17, we have all that Jesus taught that's recorded in Scripture during the Last Supper, during the night he was betrayed. And he told the guys, he said, listen, I... I'm only going to be with you a little longer, and then I'm going away. And so their hearts were troubled. It's like, wait, wait, he's going away. Where is he going away? He told them he was going to be betrayed, and one of them was going to be the betrayer. Oh, no, this is terrible. And so their hearts are troubled, and he starts off John 14. He says, let not your hearts be troubled, because their hearts were troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. He says, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. I said, Thomas, so Lord, we don't know the way. Show us the way. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. And they were really struggling. And then Jesus says this to them. He talks to them about prayer. He talks to them about praying in his name. And then he talks to them about the promise of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 15 of John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Jesus is telling the disciples the Holy Spirit is coming. It's the promise of the Spirit. Now, here's our question. Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? Three discoveries today. Discovery number one. The Holy Spirit is another just like Jesus. He's another just like Jesus. Verse 16, and I will ask the Father, this is the Son praying to the Father, and he will give you another. Stop right there. He will give you another. Now, that's a key word in verse 16. I have it underlined in my Bible. Now, in Greek, you have two different words in the Greek New Testament, two different words for another. One word is heteros. Heteros means another that is different. It's similar, but it's, it's different. And then there's another Greek word, alos. Alos means another that is exactly the same. Suppose I were writing, and I have this particular pen, and I'm at home, and I'm writing something, and this pen runs out of ink. And so I say to Debbie, I said, Debbie, can you get me another pen? This is a black pen. It is black ink. Can you get me another pen? 
And she says, sure, I get you another pen. And she gets me this pen. Well, this pen is red. This is a heteros pen. It's, it's a pen just like this is a pen, but it's totally different than this one, right? Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will send another, not heteros, but an alos, another of the same exact kind. And here is a pen, and I, if I asked Debbie and we spoke Greek at the house, which we don't, we're just mostly Hebrew, and... Uh, we spoke Greek at the house, and I said, Debbie, can you get me an Alice pen? And she would get me this pen. It's exactly the same. See, this pen says, compliments of Kathy Brolo, First Baptist Church, and it has our address. And you know what? This one says the same thing. They're exactly the same. They're the same color. They're the same weight. Everything is the same. Exactly the same. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is another just like Jesus. Now, important to know that Jesus is just like the Father. He is the exact representation of the Father. That's who Jesus is. He came to show us the Father. Uh, the disciples asked him in John chapter 4. Philip asked him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough and Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says this about Jesus, and he, Jesus, is the radiance of his glory, his meaning the Father's, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. That's why he can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because I and the Father are one. And everything about the Father, his character, his nature, his glory, that's in me. That's who I am. The way the Father thinks, that's the way I think. The way the Father acts, that's the way I act, because I'm a chip off the old block. I am the same as he is, the exact representation of the Father. And the Holy Spirit is the exact representation of Jesus. The exact representation of Jesus. We say, well, what, what is the Holy Spirit like? He's like Jesus. So you read in the Bible, and see, we, we, we struggle with, with um, understanding the Spirit so often, but if you understand the Son, then you can understand the Spirit, because the Spirit is, is another just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. And it's pretty wonderful when you think about it. He's going to send another just like Jesus. So there's Jesus that we have, and then we have another just like Jesus, the Spirit. And uh, they're both there to work in our lives and to help us. And so here is the Holy Spirit. He thinks the way Jesus thinks. He acts the way Jesus acts. He reacts the way Jesus would react because he's just like Jesus. You see, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Third person of the Holy Trinity. Now notice, notice, if you're writing notes, and I hope you are, notice person. He's a person, the third person of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit, here, here's one of the problems that some of us have. We kind of see the Holy Spirit as a force, you know, like Star Wars, the force is with you. And we kind of see the spirit like that. We don't see Jesus like that. Why? Because Jesus had a body. And so we're able to identify with him differently because he had a body. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a body. But the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a force. He's not a fog. He, he's not a ghost. That's a bad translation of the Greek word pneuma. Pneuma is spirit. But the King James translators translated it ghost. And so for a long time, people thought of the Holy Spirit like the Holy Ghost. And what is a ghost? Kind of a phantom. Kind of now you see it, now you don't. I don't know where it was. It's just kind of some uh, gaseous, nebulous mass just kind of floating around somewhere. And you say, well, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. He's not a fog. He's not a force. He's not an it. He's a he because he's a person. And he has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions. Did you know that you can grieve the Holy Spirit? The Bible says do not grieve the Holy Spirit because you can 
You, you can wound his heart. You can, you can hurt him and, and make him sorry in his heart. And, ah, oh, he just feels such grief when you and I sin against him. You know, the Bible, when, when before it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God who is in you, whom you've been sealed for the day of your redemption, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Before that, it says in Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Did you know when we let our mouth go and let our tongues loose in evil, in speaking things that tear people down and hurt people, and don't build them up and they're not, your, your words don't have any grace to them. They just have fire to them and they're just burning everything down. That grieves the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He can be grieved. But because he has emotions, not only can he be grieved, he can be gladdened. You and I can do things that will uh, gladden the heart of the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 15 says this. My son, if your heart is wise... My own heart also will be glad, and my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. Boy, when we say the right thing to another person, and when we speak the truth in love, that gladdens the heart of the Holy Spirit. He's a person. He is the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, you've seen me use this before. It's a very crude illustration, but it's an illustration of the Trinity. And the reason I use it is because the Trinity is really, really hard to understand. As one theologian said, the Trinity, define it, you lose your mind. Deny it, you lose your soul. I, it is central to the Bible, now, some have said, well, you know, if Trinity is so important, the word Trinity, Jeff, is not even used in the Bible. The word Trinity was a word that Tertullian, the early church father, came up with in uh, the late 100s, early 200s A.D. So how is Trinity so important? Well, here's the thing. Trinity is not used in the Bible, neither is the word missions used in the Bible, but we all agree missions are very, very important. Trinity is not used in the Bible, but it's taught in the Bible, and it's taught in the Bible in the very first chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That's what God says. Now, we, we know there's one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's the Hebrew Shema. That's what they would repeat every single day. They knew God was one, but one God is revealed in three persons. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, like this three-legged stool. Now, in this three-legged stool, each one of these legs is separate and distinct, but each one of these legs is the same. And if you, if you were to look at this and you say, well, I guess you have three stools up there, Jeff. No, I don't have three stools. I have one stool. One stool that has three legs, and if you take away a leg, then the stool doesn't work. God exists in Trinity. He exists in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Son is just like God the Father, the exact representation of his nature. And God the Holy Spirit is just like God the Son. And they're all, the three are one, and they're all exactly the same, but they're distinctly three different persons. Some people say, well, you know, if Jesus, if he were God, then how did he pray in the garden to himself? He was praying to the Father, but he's God, so he's praying to himself. No, he's, he's God the Son praying to God the Father. They're, they're one, but they're separate and distinct. God the Father didn't die on the cross. God the Holy Spirit didn't die on the cross. God the Son died on the cross. But the Holy Spirit is God. And the way you know that beyond any shadow of any doubt, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, where Ananias and Sapphira, when they uh, brought an offering to the Lord, but they were lying about it. They said, well, we sold this property for this amount, and we're giving this whole amount to uh, the work of the, the Lord. And they lied because they kept back some of the profit for themselves. And Peter said this in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. He said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. 
Because the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus said to the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because Jesus is God. And the Holy Spirit says to us today, if you have seen me, you have seen the Son because the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit. So that's the first discovery. He is another just like Jesus. Second discovery, the Holy Spirit is the divine paraclete. The divine paraclete. You say, paraclete, what does that mean? Well, paraclete is a transliterated word. It's a word in the English dictionary, paraclete. It comes from the Greek word parakletos. And parakletos is what is used here for the word in the New American Standard, helper. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, alos, just the same, uh, alos, just like I am, another helper, parakletos, that he may be with you forever. Now, a parakletos is a combination word, para and kaleo, which means called alongside called alongside to render aid. That's what that word parakletos means. And it translates it in the New American Standard and many other versions, helper. Some translations, comforter. The King James, comforter. I will send you another comforter. Some translate it, I will send you another advocate. We know that Jesus is our advocate because the Scripture says that in 1 John chapter 2. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So this is going to be another one, and he's just like Jesus, although he doesn't have a body. He's just like Jesus, and he does the very same things that Jesus does because he's another helper. He's called alongside to help us. Now, that's a, a very awesome thought when you let your mind loose in the fact that, hey, the Lord has... When he left, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you, but I'm going to come to you in the person of the Holy Spirit, and he's going to be your helper. He's called alongside to help you. David said in Psalm 54, verse 4, Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. Now, when David said, Behold, God is my helper, the word behold, anytime you see the word behold, the behold is like a surprise word. It's like a, hey, listen to this. Hey, look at this. Behold. It's a, it's a back to the future word where, where uh, you know, hello, McFly. It's one of those kind of words that says, pay attention to this. Behold, the Lord, he's my helper. He's my helper. The God who spoke the worlds into existence, he's my helper. He's my shepherd. He's the one who helps me and leads me. Now notice, it doesn't say the Lord is my condemner. The Lord is the one who beats me up. The Lord is the one who every day tells me how crummy I am and how bad I'm doing and how rotten I am as a wife, as a husband, as a dad, as a mom, as a, as a, a kid, as a coach as an employee, as an employer. He's not that. Jesus said he didn't, the Father didn't send the Son into the world to the condemn the world. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. That the world, he says, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And so that was the mission of the Lord Jesus to seek and to save that which was lost. The Holy Spirit is another just like that, and he comes to help you, not to condemn you. Sometimes the help is, hey, you're messing up here. Let's get, you're on the wrong track here. You're going the wrong direction here. We need to move to this other road. We need to turn around. And, and sometimes that's the help that you need and I need. But here's the point. He came to help us. Behold, God is my helper. So do you need some help today? You need help in life? Anybody struggling today? You say, oh, if I just had somebody who would help me. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's the parakletos, the, the paraclete who comes alongside, and he comes alongside to render aid, to help you, to bring comfort to you. The word comfort means with strength, to encourage you, to spur you on, to motivate you. You know, the Scripture says we're supposed to do that, and one of the things that church is supposed to be about is to be about the, the business of encouragement. Encourage one another, but the Bible says, day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So we come together to church and we encourage one another to love and good deeds. 
That's a big part of what church is. Encourage one another to trust God. Encourage one another to keep going. The Holy Spirit is our comforter and our encourager and our helper. And so if you need help, he says, I'm here. And I have been given for this purpose, to help you. Now, the Scripture says that he, Jesus said, the world can't know him, verse 17, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Very, very important, and will be in you. See, the Spirit is called alongside to help you, and he is living inside to empower you. Living inside to empower you. Jesus refers to himself as the helper here because there's another helper, which means he's the helper too. But he was called alongside to the disciples to be among them, to walk with them. Here's the difference. The Holy Spirit is not just going to abide with you, Jesus said. He is going to be in you. Hold the phone. He's going to be in me? Whoa, that's never happened before. The Old Testament, see, this isn't the, this isn't the uh, introduction of the Holy Spirit like it's his first rodeo, like he's been in the, uh, just sitting on the bench the whole time that Jesus has been you know, on the earth and the Holy Spirit's just up in heaven just like, yeah, I'm just on the bench. I, pretty soon I'm, uh, they're gonna call my number and then I go in and you know, Jesus is gonna uh, ascend to heaven and then 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, that's, that's when I go in the game. Uh-uh, it's not like that. The Holy Spirit, he comes on the scene in Genesis chapter one, verse two. Verse 2, the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was moving on the face of the earth. He's been involved since the beginning, this God, the Holy Spirit. And he is being used in the Old Testament. He comes upon people. The Spirit of the Lord, the Scripture says in the book of Judges, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, literally clothed himself with Gideon. He came upon Gideon. He came upon David when he whipped Goliath. He came upon Samson when Samson defeated a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. He would come upon people, and when David sinned, remember he he prayed, Psalm 51, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Lord, there's an anointing. There's a hand of the Holy Spirit on my life as king here in Israel. Lord, don't take your hand away. Don't take the power of the Spirit away from my life. That was his prayer. So the Holy Spirit would come upon people but he never lived inside of people. And now, Jesus said, this, this another, this one just like me, I'm gonna go to heaven and he's gonna come and he's gonna be just like me. And here's the thing, he's not gonna just abide with you. He's gonna be in you and he's gonna be in you forever, forever. When the Holy Spirit of God comes into your heart and your life, he comes in when you receive Christ as Savior and Lord. When you do that, then he comes to live inside of you and he comes to live inside forever. Some people believe you can lose your salvation. I don't believe that. When you have genuine, true salvation and you receive the Holy Spirit of God, he comes in forever. The old preacher Ron Dunn used to say, my heart is not a hotel with checkout time at 12 noon. Uh, The Lord comes in and he doesn't ever check out. He's gonna be with me forever to live inside of me, to empower me. Now, let me just ask you this question. Be honest. How many of you have ever thought to yourself, man, if I could have just lived at the time that Jesus was on earth doing his miracles, if I could have been one of the the 12, just hang out with Jesus for three and a half years, that would have been the bomb. That would have just been the best It's fantastic. It's the best. I love it. You would have had that kind of attitude. Who would say that? You'd trade right now and say, I'd rather be with Jesus right now and and experience that. Okay, three of us. Uh, (laughs) Maybe there's some more that you just didn't want to say. Uh, You know, when I I was first in my Christian life, I would think, man, Lord, I would much rather be back then and to see you, and to see your miracles, and experience that, and to hear all the things you said. You know, John said, if the things 
everything that Jesus said was recorded, the, the world couldn't hold the books that would be written. Man, we have a small book compared to that. This Bible and the New Testament of what Jesus said and did, just the Gospels primarily, and it's like, wow. The, the, the world couldn't contain the books that would be written. The, all the things that Jesus said and did, and you could experience that. You know, Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 16, he said, uh, I, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper shall not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. It's to your advantage. It's like, really? It's to my advantage that you go away? That doesn't seem right. It seems it's at my disadvantage that you're going away. That's why my heart's so troubled, Lord. Think about it this way. You know, there's an Olympic event, two-man volleyball, sand volleyball. Maybe you've watched it. It's pretty exciting. It's amazing what some of those people can do. Two-man volleyball. If you've ever played sand volleyball, you know how hard it is to move on the sand. Um, it's just, a, it's an awesome sport, but it's hard. Suppose you're playing two-man volleyball and your partner is Jesus. You'd be pretty good, right? Because even though I'm crummy, he's incredible. See, so a two-man volleyball. Here's the thing. Two-man volleyball. Jesus said, hey, guys, we've been playing two-man volleyball, but I want to tell you something. It's to your advantage that I go away. And Peter's like, you go away. You're my, you're my two-man volleyball partner, and I, I, I'm not very good. You're great. You're incredible. We win every time because you can get everything, and you block everything, and you spike everything, and, and now you're going away. And how, that, how could that possibly be to my advantage? He says, because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you, and he's just like me. He plays volleyball just like I do, and he's gonna be with you, and he's gonna live inside of you. He's gonna enable, enable you to play volleyball like I play it. Whoa, I can play like you? That's pretty cool. Really, Lord? It is to my advantage that you will go away then because I can have power. See, the Holy Spirit came not just to walk alongside of us, as Jesus walked alongside of us, but even go a step further, and that's why it's to your advantage that Jesus goes away, because now he lives inside of you. Now we talk about Jesus, inviting Jesus into our hearts, and we do that, but he comes in through the person of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you, and how does he come to you? Through the person of the Holy Spirit. And he comes in to give you power power to rise above, power to overcome sin, power to overcome the overwhelming urge for despair, power to overcome the, the bitter feelings you feel when someone stabs you in the back. He gives you power to speak. You read in the book of Acts, Peter had no power when he was on his own, but when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, boom, he became a powerhouse because the Lord comes in to give you power power. So the Holy Spirit is the divine paraclete, the one called alongside, the, long, the one who comes to live on the inside. Or do you not know that your body, Paul said, is a temple of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. Discovery number three. Not only is the Holy Spirit another just like Jesus, not only is the Holy Spirit the divine paraclete, but number three, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth. And he says in verse 17, that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. The spirit of truth. That's what Jesus called the Holy Spirit. He says, he will teach you, verse 26, teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now, you write this down. The Holy Spirit is your guide and your teacher of truth because he's the spirit of truth. And he wants to guide us in truth and he wants to teach us truth. That's his job. That's his ministry. Sometimes... You know, when I mention churches that get uh, off kilter with the Holy Spirit, one of the things that people fail to realize is this. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, he shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit is like that spotlight right up there. 
The Holy Spirit doesn't say, hey, look at me, I'm the Holy Spirit. Everybody look at the spotlight. The Holy Spirit is a spotlight on the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything he does says, look to Jesus, look at Jesus. And the way he guides us and the way he teaches us is he teaches us about Jesus. That's his ministry. And a church that gets overboard on Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, and they glorify the Holy Spirit and they focus on the Holy Spirit and everything is about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, hey, you're focusing in on the spotlight and the spotlight is to shine the light on the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't get that confused. He is the spirit of truth. He guides you in truth, truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did on the cross and what he wants to do through his spirit in your life, in and through your life. He is the guide. Now, does anyone ever have this trouble you're sitting down and you wake up in the morning and you get up and maybe you get a cup of coffee or something like that and it's like, okay, I need to have a quiet time. I, need, I know I need to spend time with God. But maybe you don't know where to start. Maybe you don't know how to do this. Maybe you just, where in the Bible do I read? The Bible's a big book. I'm not sure. And you read and you don't really understand and it seems dry and time seems to go by so slowly and you try and pray and, you, well, I'm, gonna, I'm supposed to pray for, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes and after about 30 seconds, you're like, I'm running out of things to pray about. And it's just kind of difficult. Now, how different would it be if you got up tomorrow morning and you sat down at your uh, coffee table, and next to you was Jesus. And he says, hey, open up the book. Read it, and I'll tell you what it says. I'll explain it to you. Wouldn't you be excited to wake up tomorrow morning if you knew, hey, man, at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm meeting with Jesus. We're going to talk through this thing. Most of us would say, I'd be pretty excited. I wouldn't be late. I'd want to meet with Jesus. Well, listen, the Holy Spirit of God, who is another Jesus, just like him, the third person of the Trinity, he lives inside if you're a Christian. He doesn't live inside if you're not a Christian. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer, he lives inside. And he says, I wanna guide you in truth. I wanna help you to understand truth. So if you will look to me, I will help you understand this book. Did you know that the Holy Spirit of God is the one that wrote the Bible? Scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, that men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, thoroughly, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the Holy Spirit is the one who breathed that into people's hearts. And men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The Spirit wrote the word. The Spirit illuminates the word. He brings the light to the word so that you can understand it. He is our teacher in truth. He is our guide in truth. So when you wake up tomorrow morning, you can sit down and you can know with confidence, Lord, would you teach me what this says? Lord, would you show me? Lord, I'm struggling with this. I'm not sure what this means. Will you explain this to me? How cool. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, two guys were on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus came up and walked with them. They were talking about the events that Jesus had been crucified, and they were talking about it, and Jesus said, hey, what are you guys talking about? They said, well, don't you know? I mean, we're talking about Jesus. Everybody's talking about Jesus. We thought he was the Messiah, but, but then they crucified him. But then there were some women that said that he, he rose from the dead, but I mean, who would believe that? And so Jesus starts to engage them in conversation, and then he says, oh, foolish men and slow in heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer and enter into his glory? And it says that he showed them the things concerning himself in all the scripture. And then he acted, they got to Emmaus and he acted like he would go on further and they said, please stay with us, it's getting late, please stay with us. And they got him to stay and they still didn't recognize him. He was kept from their eyes. They didn't recognize him until he broke bread at dinner and then all of a sudden they recognized this is Jesus and he vanished from their sight. And they said these words, were not our hearts burning within us when he explained the scriptures to us? When he showed us the things from the word of God, it just made our hearts burn with passion. That's the Lord who explains the scriptures. That God lives inside my heart. He lives inside your heart if you're a believer. He wants your heart to burn with passion. He wants to teach you his word if you'll just ask him. 
If you'll just say, Spirit of truth, teach me the truth. I don't want to walk in error. I don't want to believe lies. I want to believe the truth. And I want my heart to burn within me with passion for the word and for, the lo- and for God, for love for God. Hey, he's the, the guide and the teacher of truth. And if you have a decision to make, he says, I'll guide you in truth. If you look to me, if you'll ask me, if you'll say, Holy Spirit, you who are resident within me, will you show me what to do? I have choice A and choice B, and I'm not sure what to do. I have job A and job B, I'm not sure what to do. Lord, show me what to do. In the book of Isaiah, the scripture says, your teacher will help you. And you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. That's the Holy Spirit of God who does it. That's his job to guide us in truth and to teach us so that our hearts would burn with passion for his word and for the Lord. He's your guide and teacher. And you know the scripture says you can't know spiritual truth apart from him. He's the one that illuminates. He's the one that opens blind eyes. I can't do that. I can preach truth, but only the Holy Spirit of God can impart truth to you. And unless he does that, you will never know truth. You know, it says in verse 17, whom the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. Here's the thing when it relates to God. You can know things about God, but you can't know God apart from the Holy Spirit. He's the one that illuminates who God is. He's the one who shows you your need. He's the one who brings you to Christ. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't draw you, you ain't coming. And you can't figure it out on your own. Interesting, interesting, interesting. The Jews that followed Jesus around, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they were watching Jesus perform miracles, and they watched Jesus cast out a demon uh, of this man who was uh, dumb, And they said these words. They looked at the whole situation and they came up with this conclusion. This man casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of the demons. That's human wisdom. They get it so wrong that they look at Jesus, the Lamb of God, the King of glory, and say, you're from hell. You are Beelzebul, the prince of demons. It's the Holy Spirit that has to illumine the heart to show you Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. And unless you put your faith and trust in him, you will never, no, never, ever, ever experience eternal life. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. And you can't know spiritual truth apart from him. So, do you know him? Let me just close with this. We talked about two-man volleyball. You know, two-man volleyball, when when the Lord comes to live inside of you through his spirit, he gives you power. And all of a sudden, you become an incredible two-man volleyball player. There's power there. You can jump. You couldn't jump before. There's, man, you can spike. You can get balls. You never, All of a sudden, you can do lots of stuff. Now, let me ask you something. When you look at your own life and you ask yourself this question, do I really know him? Are you any different on the volleyball court? You still playing the sorry game you played before you quote unquote walked an aisle, before you quote unquote got baptized? Has there been any change in your volleyball playing? Can you honestly say, well, the Holy Spirit of God has come into my life because, man, there's a difference, and everybody can tell. It's, that guy was a terrible player, and now he's a great player. I mean, there's a change that took place in him. Or are you still the same sorry player that you were before? Many people are clinging to a salvation that's not genuine, it's not real, it's not true. And the proof is you're still a crummy volleyball player. When the Lord comes in, he changes everything. When the Lord takes up residence in you, everything starts to change. And it's real. And you can't receive that through the world. You have to receive that through the Spirit. And you don't pray, Holy Spirit of God, I want to know you better. It's Holy Spirit of God Help me to know Jesus better because the Holy Spirit is the spotlight on the Lord Jesus and we receive the Lord Jesus and when we do his spirit, another just like Jesus comes to live inside of us and he changes us from the inside out. Has that ever happened to you? If not, today is the day for you 
to receive by faith the Lord Jesus. And when you do, you get his spirit who changes everything. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit today, about who he is and what he does. And the big question is this, does he live in you? Have you received the gift of the Holy Spirit? You see, the Holy Spirit comes into your life when you turn from your sin and surrender your all to Jesus, the one who died for you and rose again. Maybe you're saying, well, Jeff, I really don't know how to do that. I want to do it, but I don't know how. Well, let me help you. Let me lead you in a simple prayer, and you can ask the Lord to come into your life. Just pray with me, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again from the dead. And Lord, right now I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Holy Spirit, live inside of me. I surrender my all to you, Lord and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in by His Spirit and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real